flipped classrooms, one of my favorite things, and how we can use them to leverage flexible models for IET programs. As James said, Mark and I really want to try to make this conversation as interactive as possible. We're going to start with an overview of flipped classrooms so that we're all on the same page talking about them. But then as you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Feel free to post things in the chat. As he said, we have a colleague on the line helping to manage all of our conversation. Um, after a brief introduction, what is a flipped classroom? Why does it work so well for language learning and IET? We'll go into some details about IET models and then, like I said, have time for questions and takeaways. So my name is Katie Brown. I'm NGEN's founder and our chief education officer. I started my career about 25 years ago working with adults and I've been doing it ever since. My PhD is in second language acquisition. I've worked um, as an ESL teacher at a community college in adult basic education settings. I got my PhD in second language acquisition, spent about 10 years in higher ed doing research on the intersection of technology and language learning. And it's all been around the idea that we can use technology to remove barriers to make learning more effective and efficient for adults. So I'm super excited to be here with you today. And Mark, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Katie. And um, it's a pleasure to, to join you on this webinar. So Mark Goldberg, I'm based here in Portland, Oregon. I've been in adult education for uh, 20 plus years. I'm an ESOL instructor, have my master's in uh, bilingual ESOL education, um, have worked as an instructor, um, ran a program and, and taught in an IET program in San Francisco with a nonprofit that partnered with City College back in the day for immigrant nurses, a refresher course, and then have been in Portland for about 15 years and worked as an administrator for um, two different community colleges supporting adult ed and workforce development programs and was able to help uh, one of my colleges really expand our IET models through the years with different funding streams and um, partnerships. And so I think the topic of integrated education and training is, is a passion of mine and really interested in the intersectionality as you are with technology and flipped classrooms. Great. And with that, we'll get started with what is a flipped classroom? And a flipped classroom is when individualized learning is shifted out of the classroom and classrooms are used for active collaborative learning. So you can see in this picture, on the left-hand side, we have someone lecturing, which is what Mark and I are doing today, which is really not a great way to teach adults. If you are just delivering a lecture, they can get that lecture outside of class. And instead, you can use your time as a teacher for individualized instruction, spending time working with small groups and facilitating learning by doing. So when you talk about a flipped model at its, at its essence, this is what we mean. And it, it's an acronym. And there are four pillars of a flipped classroom. They're flexible. They promote a learning culture. The content is intentional. And you have professional educators. And the most important thing I think to remember about this model is it needs some planning. You can't just decide like today is Wednesday, tomorrow I'm going to use a flipped model with my welding class. Uh, it's not a, a huge heavy burden to facilitate a flipped classroom once you get going with this model, but you have to decide in advance it needs to be intentional and you need to think about where students are going to learn and what makes the most sense for them to learn inside the classroom versus outside the classroom. So here are some fun facts about the flipped classroom. It started actually in STEM fields. And I think it's because in those fields, there's a heavy emphasis on needing to understand the concepts first, something that traditionally happened through lectures. And instructors realized we can just pull that out. Learners can get those lectures on their own. When they come to class, we can actually work on solving real problems. So the main point of this is to move away from teacher-centered lecture style instruction. As Mark suggested, technology-enabled instruction is perfect for this because when learners are working on their own outside of class, you want them to be getting personalized instruction. And there are many, many tools we can use to help adults get differentiated instruction regardless of what they need. Uh, there are multiple successful models, but it's really truly ideal for language learning and for IET. 
So why is it ideal for language learning? Well, learning a language is learning a skill. It's not studying a content area. And adults learn best by doing. And so a model like this that focuses on creating a classroom space where they can do things helps with language learning. You need these four buckets for language learning to work. Learners need access to input or they need to hear the language that they're learning to speak. They need to produce it themselves. They need to interact and get feedback. And an IET model with a flipped classroom is perfect for language learners, but also perfect for any adults who have specialized needs. Adults who need help with numeracy skills, adults who need help with literacy skills, adults who have been working in the field for which they're getting a credential, but are missing some of the foundational knowledge in that field. This flipped model works because the input that learners need, they can get before they're in the classroom actually working on developing those workplace skills. So th there's an approach to language teaching, task-based language teaching, which is truly, it was not designed for IET, but it seems like it should have been. Because the whole idea is to teach language by having people do real tasks rather than pulling it out as something separate. And that fits into this IET model. You're integrating the training with the language education that learners need. And when we do it in a flipped way, we can work with learners at different proficiency levels, learners with different levels of formal education, learners at different places in their educational journey, because you're able to differentiate their instruction before they come into a classroom where they can work using what they've learned outside of class. I'm gonna pause here actually, Mark, and see if you have anything you wanna add or if there are any questions in the chat, which it doesn't seem like we have any questions. No, I think just uh, reinforcing for English language learners, the flexibility um, in different English proficiency levels as well in this flipped classroom model. So Thank learning you. differences and even just proficiency level differences as you, as you mentioned. Yeah, so this works for learners who are beginners, it works for learners who are advanced because what you can do is give them the support they need at their own level, at their own pace. And see, there's oh. a question in the chat. You wanna take it? <laughs> so integrate, IET is integrated education and training, which pairs the foundational skills. Thank you, uh, Jindy. Um, pairs the foundational skills that may be English proficiency, reading, writing, math, along with technical skills um, towards some type of, um, uh, well, in Oregon and many places, it's a, you know, college certificate, a career pathway certificate. Um, so it's the blending of those two areas um, in an accelerated contextualized fashion. Exactly. The idea with IET is that we don't pull foundational skills out of training for some other real credential. We're including them in the training so that we can bring more learners along with us and be more inclusive in who gets access to credentials, certifications, career training. So a flipped classroom is built around doing the right thing at the right time in the right place. The work that learners do outside of the classroom feeds classroom activities, which feeds subsequent out-of-class work. So Imagine learners are engaging individually with content related to, let's pick a field, let's say that learners are in an allied healthcare program, they're working towards getting a certificate as a certified nursing assistant. Some of the learners in this certificate program are fluent English speakers working on the CNA certificate. Um, some of those learners need help with basic numeracy, numeracy skills or literacy skills. We also have non-native English speakers in this program at all different proficiency levels. So outside of class, learners are working on an individualized pathway, getting them the foundational skills they need to succeed during the certified nursing assistant training program. When they get to class, they're working on common tasks following a set syllabus, but they've been preparing for those tasks in their own way. And then when they're going to their next session of being outside of the classroom, whatever they did in the class will feed into what they're asked to do outside of class to prepare for the next session. Could I add just a, sorry, Please. Katie, just a quick yeah. thought. So um, one of the things that I, learned when I became familiar with IET is um, having been a dean for all of adult education programs, including 
our, our ESOL program, but our GED program as well is just the dynamic model of an IET being accessible to English language learners, but also students who may be native English speakers who are working towards their high school equivalency and then learning as close to Washington State and the IBEST model, which is really the gold standard, is that traditional career technical education students have also benefited from this integrated education and training model. So even with English, you know, strong or native English proficiency skills and a high school equivalency, that additional support in those foundational skills benefits all students. But then with this flipped classroom model, then it can get into the individualized um, additional support that say English uh, language learners may need versus other students. Exactly. So there was a question about that. How would it work for English language learners um, or adult learners? How would it vary for each set of learners? I can take a stab at answering it or you can just keep going. No, go for it and I'll fill in after. Okay. So the way it works differently for each, and this is a great question because it really gets at what's different about a flipped classroom, which is that you're not deciding in advance what the learners are going to do outside of class. You're responding to learners. So you'll have some idea at the beginning of your CNA certification that some learners are going to need more support with literacy skills. Some are going to need more support with numeracy skills. Some are going to need some science background. Others are going to need more English language skills. And you can find resources to support those learners when they're outside of class so that you can put them into groups based on what their needs are. Learners can be working with, for example, our English language learning platform is adaptive and personalized and learners get content related to allied healthcare and actually CNA certification outside of class. Um, but then when they come into class and they're working their way through the technical training, you will notice things about them and you'll see who is needing more support, who needs less support, who needs different support. So you build an overarching plan for how the training will work and how you will support learners with additional skills development when they're not in the classroom. And then you adjust it as you go along. Mark, how would you answer that? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think even for sort of back to English language learners, there could be medical terminology that's taught at more of an intermediate level for students that are there. And if you do have um, students with different English proficiency, there could be more simplified um, intro introduction of that vocabulary. Um, so sort of scaffolding for those who are, who are at a lower proficiency level. Exactly. And pre-teaching pre some things, letting learners get exposed to it before they come to class. Um, another thing that I will point out, I forget where the slide is or I would point it out now, maybe it's next, is that this model requires strong participation from the learners. So one of the first things you do when you want to have a flipped classroom model, especially for IET, where different learners will need different things, is conduct a needs assessment up front so you can figure out where people are and who needs what, and then make sure learners understand how the model works and that they're going to get extra help when they need it. So they should be thinking about what kind of extra help would help them and asking for it. A lot of times, especially with language learners, they come to class and they think the teacher is going to just give me English. I'll sit here and I will get it because that's how this works. It's transactional. I go to class and I learn something. And that, that actually isn't how most things work. And it's definitely not how language learning works. So the learners need to be engaged in the process and have a sense of agency. And that works really well with these models because they can advocate for what they need. Okay. Um, and no, my next slide was this, which is I, we've mostly talked about, but you want to use software for what technology can do best so people can do what humans do best. We never want to get rid of teachers. We want to use technology to help teachers extend their reach, be more efficient, and focus on the things that only teachers can do, which is watching learners in a hands-on classroom, figuring out who needs help with what, giving learners feedback on their language skills, giving them feedback back on their developing skills, um, and let software give them personalized practice with vocabulary flashcards beforehand. So if we're using technology to solve a real problem and we're thinking about flipping our IET programs around, when you're planning out these programs, you should ask yourself some questions up front. One of them is how can I use technology to solve a real problem? One of the ways is differentiation. Another is tracking performance so that you know where your learners are. 
Um, and then what can technology make better? How can you improve upon what goes on in face-to-face -face settings? And as I said, technology can really help optimize teacher power so that teachers move from being doing what Mark and I are doing right now, which is lecturing, um, and do things that are more responsive and more meaningful and offering insights. The Q&A part of this is, is that. So the types of things that you want to focus on when you're building a flipped model for an IET is promoting differentiation, personalization, also collaboration and interaction. When you move the a lot of the, the learning outside of the classroom, learners can come into class and work with colleagues at different levels with different skills on problem-based learning and inquiry-based instruction. And it, they learn a lot more. Adults learn best by doing, and they learn best when they're doing things that are at the right level, that are interesting to them and that are relevant to them. And the whole idea here of the data-driven curricula shouldn't be scary. What I mean by this is respond to your learners. Look at how they're doing in the technical training that they're participating in and figure out what you can do to help them. What happens so often in CTE programs, especially with learners who are coming in with language proficiency barriers or literacy barriers or numeracy barriers, is that at the beginning of the semester or the term or the credential, they're fine. And then when the content gets too technical, they get overwhelmed. So thinking about ways to give them supports as they go along to avoid that is really the best way to have a more inclusive program. And sometimes that means stretching out the length of the program because learning to do anything in a language that isn't your first language is really, really hard. And sometimes you just need some extra time. So letting learners repeat the modules multiple times, having them think about what would help them get through it are ways that you can help support learners in a program like this. So Katie, I think you may have just answered that question, but what, see there was a question on uh, clarifying what reducing cognitive load means. So anything more you'd wanna say about that? Yeah, you're right. So, so what I'm saying about reducing the cognitive load is just a lot of times what happens, especially with language learners is that we all have limited attentional resources and sometimes it just takes more time for language learners to get the same amount of content. So thinking of ways to um, make it more accessible. And that's really what reducing the cognitive load means. There's also a point here, which I totally agree with, which is advocating for technology. It's not necessary for flipping the classroom. That is 100% true. If something on paper makes sense for an outside assignment, use it, of course. I am the last person to advocate using technology for the sake of technology. We should only use technology when it solves a problem. And so when you're sitting down to design your flipped model, you wanna think about objectives and content, structure for in-class activities, learner agency, which I mentioned up front, and an evaluation plan. I suggested a needs assessment. These are some questions that you can ask. Um, who is learning the language? What do they need to do with it? Will they need to read, write, listen, or speak? It's possible, depending upon the IET program, that they don't need all four of those skills, which is why, and a language program built to serve as a bridge to a specific technical training program should think about which skills learners actually need. What tasks are they gonna be asked to complete? And can we find real examples of the language they'll use? Because this is what you should use to create these bridge programs and supported programs. I realize now Mark and I've been going back and forth and there's been some talk in the chat about an IET program that's supported with for English language learners versus a bridge program into an IET program. These are two different models and we're gonna talk about examples of both. Could I add, sorry, Katie, just yes. one quick thought from this needs analysis is also, and it's here, who's learning, what do they need to do with it? But also, what are your students' career goals and interests? Um, because that's really um, what should drive the development of an IET is um, rather than a traditional Path. And I know there's a lot of folks on this uh, webinar with extensive IET experience and roles, but uh, seeing the initial question of what is an IET, just want to back up a little bit and say, you know, traditional ESOL programs may have levels and a sequence that could take sometimes a year plus, and then the student doesn't have any chance to engage with content that's related to their 
background or their career goals. And so really hearing from students if they have interest in healthcare careers or manufacturing careers or business careers or whatever that is, it can help drive the needs analysis to understand where students' interests are and career goals. Um, yeah, that makes sense. There's a question right here, which is super interesting. And I'd love to get your perspective as a, a from a, a higher ed administrative viewpoint. My instructors who are not IET would like to become such. How do we help them learn how as they're doing it? Almost an IET for IET. Yeah, so, uh, and this may be um, some info I was gonna share later, but I would say there are tremendous resources out there on IET, especially after the WIOA reauthorization, the Federal Workforce Title II um, passage. Uh, which has IET baked into that policy. But um, just across the field, Washington State uh, neighbors to our north here are really the experts um, in IET with their IBEST model and have a number of resources available. If you go to their state um, board of uh, community and technical college website, um, but there's also OER Commons. So there's a lot of resources across the country of states and programs that have developed IET. And I know that COAB has a, a number of resources as well. Um, I wanted to go back to the question about cognitive load. I misunderstood the question. I thought it was about what, how do you reduce it in general, not how do you reduce it during instruction. So specifically, this is where giving learners more resources as you are going will help when they have textual support for something that is being explained out loud, when they have videos to explain concepts that they're expected to understand, when you can break things down into smaller pieces and let learners have some control over how they understand those smaller pieces, those are ways to reduce the cognitive load during instruction. What Mark and I are doing right now, as I'll say for the third time, is not good. If we were recording this, which we are, that's another thing you can do. So especially for language learners, if they can get recordings of any lectures, if they can get recordings of anything that's explained so they can watch it multiple times so that they can have textual support as they go along, those things help them as they're working on understanding the language and understanding the content at the same time. All right, so which parts go where? Think about building blocks when you're structuring activities. These are things that learners need, whether they're getting technical training, language training, whatever it is, they need to be able to understand what they're learning and they need to be able to do it. So which parts happen where in your classroom? And then when you're structuring in-class activities, these are some things that you wanna think about. How can you leverage out of class work? How do you get learners to use their productive skills? How can you foster learning by doing? What kind of feedback can the teacher give in real time, both implicit and explicit, giving learners feedback on the skills they're learning and the language they're acquiring? And this last piece is super important for in-class work in an IET in general, but definitely in a flipped IET, giving them time for reflection and planning for out-of-class work. When you're teaching people technical skills and they're learning by doing, they need time to think about what happened. So they know what to work on next because when they're in the moment learning to do something, they might not realize where they're struggling or what kind of support they need. So I mentioned this, in a flipped model, learners play a critical role and they need to know it. Here are two different models. And Mark is gonna go into some detail explaining some of these in the wild. But before we get there, I just wanted to walk you through what we're talking about. So a pre-IET on-ramp for multi-level English language learners. Here is a scenario. Learners enroll in a workplace ESL program. Outside of class, they work on personalized practice tied to their level, their interests, their goals, and the career pathways they're interested in. The instructors are using what happens out of class to drive productive activities, having them practice things that are useful across industries, things like building a LinkedIn profile, uh, calling your boss on the phone, practicing for job interviews, talking to clients, understanding technical ex uh, specifications, depending upon the field. During class, learners work in small groups organized by level or sector or interest, and then they move into CTE programs as they demonstrate competency. There are a couple of programs across the country that I can think of that use models like this. 
almost like career focused ESL boot camps. There's one at Emily Griffith Technical College. There's one um, at the Peninsula Regional Educational Program in Newport News, Virginia, that both have models like this, where learners are working on their own, on sector-specific content, getting their language skills up in a competency-based way to transition into a CTE program that also has integrated language support. Mark, do you want to talk about other programs that work like that while we're here on the slide? Yeah, and I can go um, further into detail afterwards, but I think the best one that I'm familiar with or the most established is, again, from Washington State, and that's their IDEA program, which is an acronym for Integrated Digital English Acceleration. And it's actually been around for some time. It was a pilot with funding through Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2013. And it's essentially an on-ramp into the Washington State IET model, their IBEST model. Um, and it is was designed for um, English language learners at um, EFL levels one through three, um, established by their State Board of Community and Technical Colleges. It has a flipped classroom model. So in its true full idea form, it's seven to nine hours of uh, independent work in a flipped classroom where there's um, learning activities, activities related to reading and listening, uh, reading and speaking, practice quizzes, assignments, discussions. And then it's the same amount of time, seven to nine hours in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, that really extends that student learning and has an opportunity then for collaborative um, learning, as, as Katie talked about. Uh, in, in total, I think that IDEA model has 31 modules, and it gets at those foundational skills. So computer skills, study skills, um, stress management, time management. Um, so some of those are employability skills. Some of those are more academic foundational skills, career exploration. And it's uh, preparing students for then an IET at their institution. I can say more in a bit, but that's yeah, no, uh, that, the best model that I, I'm familiar with statewide. That's great. And then this is the other sort of major model, which is flipped classrooms for IET, where learners are enrolled in a career or credential program, but use digital tools to support their learning outside of the central technical CTE training that they're in. So here's an example. Learners enroll in a medical coding training program with ESL IET. Before the course begins, they're assessed and offered additional resources according to their needs. Learners are assigned to an ESL lab. Self-paced ESL software is available for sector-specific vocabulary. Lab time is used to work on learner-specific questions and issues, and there is an ESL teacher who is part of the technical training who can help when learners have questions and problems. And all of those things that are happening in the lab or at home or in the classroom are all flexible based on the place where this is being offered so that learners get the support they need depending upon their schedules and their goals and their needs. Um, I'm, let me see if this is a question in the chat. How is support offered to students if they're struggling excessively during the pre-classroom work? Well, it depends upon what they're struggling with. So different things would help different learners based on their struggles. If they're really struggling with the, the, the language skills to understand the content, then they need more language support before they're ready to handle the content. If what they're struggling with are digital literacy skills or academic readiness skills, those can also be addressed before learners get into the program. One of the things that we found with coaching adult learners, both in workplace-based programs and adult ed settings, is that often the types of learners that we're serving have suffered some sort of educational trauma. An adult who is in a literacy program, who doesn't have a high school credential, who had interrupted formal education, something happened at some point that was not good. And there are often access hurdles that those adults need to go through in order to understand being in an educational setting. And so a lot of the time, taking the time to talk to those learners to understand what they're struggling with. Is it time management? Is it understanding all the tools? Is it the basic foundational skills can help you figure out how to best support them? Could I add to Katie that um, what I've seen as, as sort of part of the magic of an IET in addition to the, uh, or a bridge program and on-ramp, the um, integration of the foundational skills with the technical skills is also some type of career coach role 
that is supporting students along the way. And that can be as they are interested in the program and onboarding orientation, but also while they're in the program to address any sort of academic um, challenges, technology challenges, um, even outside the classroom, if I mean, we know there's unprecedented number of students right now who are facing basic needs and security. So that may be housing, food, um, and, and things beyond um, the program itself that are impacting their ability to engage. Um, and so career coaches, uh, I know it, and I think the career coach uh, from my old institution, Mount Hood Community College is on, um, do tremendous work in working with students to um, sort of identify where there may be hiccups, even in that pre-work um, flipped classroom model and helping them either directly or connect in with other resources within the institution uh, at, at a college or an adult ed provider, or even a, a separate partner, um, I don't know, separate community-based organization that provides those complementary supports. Exactly. We cannot underscore enough that, and it goes back to having this be learner-centered and needs-based. The learners will have different needs. Coaches can help identify what those needs are. And then as an institution, you can figure out how to support those learners' needs. But while we, we have students who are facing unprecedented personal challenges, and we are also, as a country, talking at a greater scale than we ever have before about access, about equity, about trying to close gaps. And we can't do that without talking to the people that we're serving to understand how to meet their needs. Um, there's a question here. At what level does your experience show that most ELL students are ready to participate in a combined ESL and IET program? Well, I think we probably each have a separate answer. So I'll let Marco first and then I'll answer. I mean, my experience years ago in developing IETs, we did have sort of a threshold for CASA scores and then would route students into traditional ESOL beginning level classes. But I think with the on-ramps and bridge models out there with, with a flipped classroom as, a, as an emerging best practice or emerging practice, I mean, I think students who were beginning level um, can, can start in an on-ramp with additional supports. Um, so I, I don't think it's get to this level and then you can engage and granted, um, there are ways to simplify the language and the activities for beginning level students, but still have the context of whatever it's going to be for an IET or a bridge. Yes, I would argue that we should get rid of the idea of proficiency levels for languages in general, because they're kind of an artificial construct that isn't actually measured the right way most of the time, but that's a different webinar probably. But learners who are high beginners um, are perfectly fine in most IET programs with ESL support, if they get the ESL support that is contextualized for them, that helps them where they need help. And that you, what you don't want to do is put people into general ESL. That makes me cringe. Like there's, there's no reason we need to teach people the names for the animals at the zoo. They should be getting the language that supports their career development and their interests and their goals right off the bat, because you can start anywhere. Um, and you might as well start with what people need. So, you know, most general purpose language classes start with introductions, but we can talk with the same introductions that you have in the workplace that you're going into. They're going to be different from workplace to workplace. So piggybacking on what Mark said, start as early as possible. And learners will rise to the occasion if they have resources to support their needs. You can improve your language skills really rapidly with a personalized adaptive approach because you start making progress right away and then you can start using the language to do real things. Um, we have a few questions. I'm just gonna go to my next slide, which I think is talking about models anyway. Um, so have we seen any examples of peer supports for outside of classroom work? A Q&A board, texting? Yeah, that's a great question and yes, I have. What I find works best for peer support is to let the learners choose how they want to communicate. So I've seen classes where they use Facebook messenger groups. I've seen classes where they all create WhatsApp groups for each other. Helping learners establish that sense of community and understand that peer support is super helpful and letting them communicate and collaborate in a way that makes sense to them works a lot better than having like a discussion board on Canvas and telling people they have to use that because that just never works. Mark, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's spot on. Um, and then the next question was, this is interesting for you, perhaps, but Michigan has been focused on how to incorporate civics into IET curricula. And have, did you experience this at all? 
Yes. So um, I think that's a great question. And I know with IELCE, so another acronym, Integrated English Literacy and Civics Education, which was part of that WIOA legislation, it requires workforce preparation as a component to that, which is um, can be integrated into an IET. And workforce preparation has, you know, a definition and, and essentially is employability skills. So as those um, uh, foundational skills can be both the English language, the reading, writing, but also, um, you know, just the like communication skills that those 21st century skills. And so I think there's some great models out there of how um, states and colleges have integrated their civics program into IET as part of the WIOA um, grant and woven in those employability skills into the model, both in a flipped classroom or even a more traditional one. Um, there's another question here about what size classes do you recommend for the flipped instruction model considering the individual needs of each student? I, Mark, do you have an I do you have a class size that you recommend? No, I, I'll I'll follow you there. I mean, I do, but I'd love to get your thoughts first. So it depends. The answer is it depends. It depends on the proficiency level of your learners. If you're thinking about English language support, it depends on what kind of technical training they're participating in. In general, I like to see a student teacher ratio of 12 to one. Um, with adult learners, they can break into small groups and the teacher can spend a good amount of time with the small groups during the live classes. If you have a much larger group and you can bring in additional non-teacher support like subject matter experts or volunteers from the community or other students further along, that's also helpful. Um, and I've seen successful classes with as many as 50 learners in a class that get broken up into to groups with team teaching. Uh, pretty much you can make whatever work, but I think a one to 12 ratio is ideal. Yeah, that sounds right. And I would say just from the career technical ed side of it is an IET as opposed to an on-ramp, depending on the field of study, there may be some ratios that are required when you think about you know, a certified nursing assistant and those rotations they do a practicum or that say machine tool technology, how many students are in a lab with one instructor. But I think to your point, in any regard, if there's additional support with a second instructor or um, any, any support um, staff uh, or peer, I think can uh, make it work with larger numbers. Exactly. <laughs> Let's see what other do you and so this is where you're going to go through some more examples for us. You've done a bunch as we've been going along, but do you have any other good flipped IET models to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I would just say a little bit more on the idea model in Washington State that I didn't get to is they um, have a number of resources on their web page for the idea program and a lot of it through OER Commons is available. Um, they saw tremendous, uh, like a, a real difference in outcomes uh, compared to traditional ESOL programs with students in the IDEA on ramps. I think it was level gains between nine and 12% higher than um, traditional ESOL programs. They also, I think I mentioned this, they um, have some models where there's a tech coach as part of it. Um, and then they also have some when, when you think about seven to nine hours in a flipped classroom seven to nine hours in a face to face they've got like a tailored idea where it's more five to seven of each if the, that total is not available. And then I mentioned they've got those, um, I think it's 31 modules that are well established with a scope and sequence um, and all of those modules have identified objectives for technology for writing for grammar and even for math, which sometimes isn't always taught for English language learners, but may be needed for the industry occupations they're pursuing. Um, and I would just say um, with some other models, so this is shifting to more of an IET flipped um, and we'll point to uh, uh, my former uh, college, Mount Hood Community College, which does the most amount of IET, I believe in our state here. They've done some hybrid IET where it's 50% Zoom during the pandemic and then 50% asynchronous learning for students in programs like early childhood education and nursing assistant and looking at some other programs as they bring their faculty along from those technical areas. And I believe they've woven in that IELCE 
Um, so civics education, those workforce preparation skills. Um, and I think that's a way to, as, as Katie's talked about, really um, personalize, individualize the instruction, make it more accessible um, in those fields and develop those technology skills. So that's one. Um, and then I know for a bridge or an on-ramp, and I'm not as familiar with the program I saw, we've got folks from Illinois who could probably speak more. There's an organization, Women Employed in Chicago, that I believe has partnered with City Colleges of Chicago and done a career foundations class, which um, is preparation for IET programs with those same type of um, foundational skills. Um, and I believe it's also accessible, the curriculum in a flipped model. Um, so uh, I think that that could be a resource to check out women employed um, with the Illinois um, IET, I think it's ICAPS is their acronym there. Um, so just uh, some other uh, resources out there that, that could support you and your institution if you're looking to explore this flipped model for IET or on-ramp programs. Awesome. So I think we have a few takeaways, which are that flipped models have been around for a long time. They prioritize individual instruction and they're perfect for language learning and IET. Content structure and learner agency are critical and you can use technology when it works to improve outcomes. Um, we have some time, I think now, like, I don't know, five or 10 minutes to answer questions. Uh, oh, my last point here is that many models make sense. Start with what your learners need, like always and forever. Whenever you teach anyone, especially adults, start with what they need. Um, so we can. Uh, can I them. add one quick thing, Katie? Yes, please. And this is maybe a shameless plug, but um, having an adult ed background and I think building on Katie's last point of this being student driven, um, a project I've worked on in the last year uh, is a way to center our adult ed student voices and i've got this logo behind me but i actually have a podcast that i created in support of our adult ed programs and career pathways programs in oregon um, where we center our students i get the chance and host it interview students who've been through iet programs and hear their amazing success stories which we always celebrate and seeing our learners uh, accomplish their goals but also get at what supports have been most important to our students and that may be that career coach. It may be financial resources to make it work because some of our most of our adult ed programs or IET may not be financial aid eligible, Pell eligible. It depends. Um, so I can drop the link to the podcast if you're interested. We've had students on from Lane Community College in Eugene, Oregon, talking from their early childhood ed program and English language learners some GED students at other colleges, uh, IET students at Portland Community College. So um, would love if you're interested just to hear from students. I also am then able to have on the college presidents from those institutions reflect on those students, inter those student interviews and also some national policy folks. So uh, more Oregon specific, but I think it's the voices of our students which really should drive our work both in practice, but also in policy. And I 100% agree. We should be listening to our students. Um, who else has questions? We have a few minutes and time to answer if anyone wants to know anything about really anything having to do with IET, CTE, language learning. Can you please repeat the resource information from the Chicago program? Yes, sorry about that. Just getting this in the chat box. So um, it is women employed. Um, and it's their career foundations program. And if I can drop it in the chat box momentarily here. And we'll just say, I, I don't know it up close. I have learned about them. And also one other resource that um, uh, I always go to, and I know they're connected with COABE is World Education. Uh, they have great expertise in IET and all, really all things adult ed. And I know we're, again, a, a close partner of COABE. Um, somebody wants to get a list of all the links in the chat box. I'm pretty sure the chat's going to get saved as a result of the webinar being saved. So I'm hoping that COID can make that available. Um, resource info for Washington that includes math, please. Mark is nodding, so he's going to do it. Um, yes, I'm happy to make the slides available. I sent a PDF of them to COID before the webinar this morning. And so I'm sure that they'll send it out to everybody who attended. 
And I can grab the link for the IDEA program in Washington State that has scope and sequence, including those math objectives. Just so there, there are two more questions. One is, um, what are the basic components of an IET? Mark? Um, you know, I think it's the integration of foundational skills with technical skills. And the model as it's designed has shared objectives. So um, the true IET model, and this is the, the IBEST gold standard, it doesn't have to be this way, but it's a team teach. So you have an adult ed instructor with a CTE technical instructor, and they sit down together and they map out, here are the technical skills and learning objectives, and then here are the foundational skills that complement them. So that's the contextualization for those foundational skills. Um, and then in an IBEST model, they're, they're in the classroom together. So um, my experience as an ESOL instructor, having worked in workforce and CTE programs, uh, I wouldn't say bluffed my way. I learned a lot as a dean of automotive welding machine tool as an ESL instructor. Um, was that our faculty in those areas know their trade and their profession, but and they may have some training as educators, but not nearly the same as an adult educator. So um, that adult education instructor, if it's a team teach or if it's a, a separate standalone class that support of those technical skills can enhance the instruction for the students. But something that I learned through the years is it also helps that CTE instructor build better skills as a as a teacher because they're learning from the adult educator on techniques and strategies to support students and all students, not just English language learners or GED students. Exactly. That, that is the, a perfect answer. Um, and I would also say that the, the basic components are resources that will help with the technical education. So the whole idea here is that you're integrating education and training. And no matter what the foundational skills are for understanding the technical training, they need to be part of an IET program. So if you're lucky enough to work in a place where they can pair an adult educator with a um, an expert in the field, that's fabulous. And if not, going and looking at the curriculum and what's required for the certification and doing some backwards design on your own of what skills and competencies you think somebody would need to be able to meet those milestones is helpful. Um, there's another question here. What happens when students do not attend class after doing the pre-work? What happens when half the class did the pre-work and the other half didn't? How do you adapt? So I got this question yesterday in a webinar on flipped classrooms. There will always be students who don't do the work that's assigned out of class for whatever reason. They didn't have time. They didn't have access. They didn't understand it. When you start with the in-class portion, one approach is to group the students who did the work together so they can keep making progress and take the students who didn't do the work and put them in a different group so they can actually do it and go forward. Um, you can also pair students who have done it with students who haven't done it, depending upon what the tasks and activities are, and try to understand what happened. Was this a one-off thing? Was the work not comprehensible to the student? Are they never going to be able to do the work? And figure out how to support them, whatever the, the scenario is. Um, but this is something that always happens. And honestly, flipped classrooms where learners are bringing stuff to class to work on in class, they tend to do the work more because the work is relevant to what happens in the classroom. I think we lost Mark. Um, hopefully he'll come back. So I love the idea of flipped classrooms and IET programs. I imagine that you start small, like you would do when implementing anything new in the classroom. Thank you for emphasizing that students must understand and be vested in this model for it to be effective, yes. Uh, for sure. And yes, starting small is good when you do anything new so that you can see how it's working and make changes. Um, and then someone in the chat is asking to Zoom observe an IET flipped class. Is anyone in here in this webinar willing to let someone else observe their class? Feel free to connect here in the chat. I think that covers the questions that we got. Uh, looks like Mark is coming back. Yeah, sorry about that. Some tech issues I'm having today. No problem. Here we have uh, Katie Nolenberger's email, who's looking for someone to connect with her who would like to observe an IET program via Zoom, which is a great idea because the best way to do anything with teachers is to get them to see other teachers working. 
And Katie, sorry, I, I lost the audio so I could see you talking, but I couldn't hear it and following the chat and then I ducked out. But um, did folks get the links that we talked about? So the um, women employed and the podcast, I think they're there. Yes, they're there. The one missing one, somebody asked again for was some the math. Yeah, someone asked for math and then somebody wants... Um, so that's it, just the math. Okay, I'm gonna put it in here. It's a link straight to a Google Sheet that has the scope and sequence. Um, so let me drop this here. Great, well, thank you so much everyone for your participation, for your questions, for your comments. Um, it was great to be with all of you today and yeah, feel free to reach out to me or to Mark if you have questions. And I think all these resources will be made available to everyone afterwards. James can confirm that. He's nodding, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> and can we go through the chat and pull out the stuff and send it in the follow-up email? Yeah, so all the um, all your materials will be posted on coeb.org along with the chat file. We can make that available as well along with uh, all the links. Great. So thank you both for a wonderful presentation. I wanna thank everybody for participating today. Um, if you could just take a minute, if you're still on the line to uh, answer our one question poll, I'll let it go up there for a little bit. And with that, again, thanks everybody. Thank you to Katie and Mark for an awesome presentation. Um, and I hope everybody has a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank you so much. Thanks.